The medium of photography developed in the 19th century. The word itself is derived from the Greek phos, meaning light, and graphe, meaning drawing or writing. So the word photography literally means drawing or writing with light. Now, the basic ideas that led to this innovation were not necessarily new. Artists had been using a very simple camera called a camera obscura since at least the early Renaissance, if not since antiquity. A camera obscura consisted of a dark room or box with a hole or an aperture in one wall. When light passed through that hole, it projects an inverted version of the exterior scene onto the opposite interior wall. An artist standing inside the camera obscura could trace over the image to capture the precise details of the scene. By about the mid-16th century, artists had realized that a person does not have to physically be inside of the box, and so they reduced the tool to a smaller portable box. Um, they added a lens to help focus the image and a mirror to the inside to flip the image right side up again. This image, which was captured with a secondary camera by contemporary photographer Abelardo Morel, gives an example of what an image projected within a camera obscura might look like. Um, the artist here has sort of transformed his hotel room into a camera obscura and captured the projected upside-down image of the Pantheon building in Paris, France. Uh, but remember, images projected by a camera obscura are not permanent. They have to be traced by hand. Uh, so true photography really couldn't exist until the images could be fixed or made permanent through a chemical process. Photochemistry was a chief focus of research in the 19th century, and various inventors were trying to formulate light-sensitive chemical compounds that could be applied to a surface and then exposed to light to sort of record the patterns of light and shadow. By about 1830, there were several figures who had kind of figured out how to record the image, but stopping or fixing the image so that further exposure to light uh, wouldn't further darken it was a bit more challenging. It wasn't until about 18... 39 maybe when about John or excuse me when a man named John Herschel discovered a compound that would finally allow that step that final step of fixing um, so that camera obscura images could be made permanent. Um, one of the first people to capture a fixed photographic image was the French inventor and chemist Joseph Niesfer Nietzsche in about 1826 or 27. Um, he placed a camera obscura loaded with a polished, light-sensitive pewter plate and aimed it uh, toward this view outside of a second-story window at his country home in Le Gras, France. Um, he uncovered the lens for anywhere from maybe about eight hours to all the way up to several days. Um, and the result is really the earliest surviving camera-made photograph. Um, Nietzsche called them heliographs from the Greek words for sun and writing. Um, now, despite the presence of recognizable objects, including buildings and rooftops here, the image is very grainy and it lacks detail. Nevertheless, this milestone uh, um, is, in Nietzsche's words, the first uncertain step in a completely new direction. And that's really true because it kind of sets the tone for the development of photography throughout the rest of the 19th century. Before his death in 1833, Nietzsche briefly worked with another Frenchman, Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre. Uh, Daguerre was a rather accomplished painter and stage designer, and he was experienced with the camera obscura and very interested in the innovations of photography. Together, the pair discovered that they could coat a polished metal plate with a silver iodide solution and make it light sensitive, and then put the plate inside the camera. Um, they would then open the shutter and expose it to light for about 20 to 30 minutes to record a latent image or an image that is sort of invisible to the naked eye um, on the coated plate. Mercury vapors were then sort of passed over the plate to reveal the image and it was chemically fixed with a table salt solution. After Nietzsche's death, Daguerre continued to refine this process and in 1839 he announced his new photographic technology to the world, which he called the Daguerreotype. 
Um, the daguerreotype was a highly detailed luminous image fixed to a copper plate that was coated with silver and polished to a mirror finish. And when it was treated, excuse me, it was treated with iodine to make it light sensitive. Um, Daguerre's techniques really reduced the exposure times, um, reduced them to maybe about 10 to 15 minutes, and he was able to create a lasting result that would not dim or darken with further exposure to light. However, he could only produce a single image at a time, and that could not be easily duplicated, and it was rather fragile. Um, so they typically would place a daguerreotype inside of this velvet lined glass case uh, for protection, which I'll show you an example in just a moment. Um, this particular photo daguerreotype, this is the artist's studio, sometimes just referred to as a still life with plaster casts. Um, this is an image that uh, Daguerre captured of a collection of objects in his studio. And you can really see the precise details that this technique uh, offers. We've got very crisp lines and high contrast of light and shadow. But keep in mind, because the exposure time is still pretty long, again, about 10 to 15 minutes, the daguerreotype was really best for recording stationary objects like these. Um, in this image from 1838, Daguerre has tried to capture the view of the Boulevard du Temple, which is a very broad boulevard in Paris. Um, it was a new addition to the city in, in this time, but he's tried to capture a view of this boulevard from a relatively high window. Again, you can really see the crisp details that the daguerreotype offers, as well as that high level of contrast, but what would have been a very busy street bustling with pedestrians and horse-drawn carriages instead appears to be deserted here. This is because to capture this image, Daguerre had to allow light into the camera or expose the plate for about eight to 10 minutes in the bright daylight. And so any people or things in motion did not register with the camera because it took too long to expose. Um, so even though the street would have in reality been filled with people and, and carriages, they were moving too quickly for the camera to record them. Um, the sky also looks blank, which is very common in these early outdoor photos because the light is changing too quickly for the chemical mixture on the plate inside the camera to really capture details like clouds and such. Um, this is, however, the first known photograph to record human figures. Um, we have a man having his shoes shined um, by another person kind of down here in the corner. Um, however, that was very likely staged um, by the artist. Um, so I've included this slide just again to give you an example. The daguerreotype is highly detailed and luminous. The image is fixed directly to the copper plate that's been coated with silver. And that plate has also been polished to a mirror level of finish. Um, so the image develops directly on the plate after an exposure time of maybe about 10 to 20 minutes, but it's quite fragile because of the metal plate. Um, and because of the polish, it's sort of reflective and it can be somewhat tricky to look at. Um, again, this image kind of shows how they would place the daguerreotype inside one of these velvet lined cases um, to protect it. So these are, you know, very detailed and, and very pretty as objects, but they have their downfalls as well. Shortly after Daguerre had made his innovations public, an American artist and inventor named Samuel Finley Brice Morse traveled to Paris to exchange information with him. Morse would share his own information about his invention, the telegraph, in exchange for um, information about Daguerre's photography processes. Um, Morse then took the information about the daguerreotype back to America, and by 1841, he had figured out how to reduce exposure times to maybe a minute or two, and so we finally have a reasonable kind of exposure time that allowed us to uh, use daguerreotypes to take portrait photographs. Um, sort of around the same time, we also have John Herschel, who invented the cyanotype 
process, which doesn't actually require a camera, um, but it uses paper coated with a light sensitive solution that is rich in iron, and that iron oxidizes when it is exposed to light, and it turns a very rich Prussian blue color. Um, in 1843, Anna Atkins made these cyanotype images using Herschel's process um, by placing pieces of algae and other plants directly on the treated paper and then exposing that to light, um, to the sunlight. The areas of exposed paper turned dark, that rich blue color, but the areas that were covered remained white. Um, again, around that same period of time, the early 1840s, late 1830s, we have the Englishman Henry Fox Talbot, who is experimenting with his own techniques that were somewhat similar. Um, he also made these sort of negative photo drawings that are quite like Atkins cyanotypes. Um, he placed plants and other objects on light sensitive paper and exposed them to direct sunlight. Talbot then started experimenting by placing the light sensitive paper within the camera to capture negative images like this one on the left of this oak tree. From there he figured out how to use that negative image and repeat the process with another sheet of light sensitive paper and invert the image, turning the light areas like the trunk and the branches dark and the dark areas like the sky light. Uh, the final positive image um, he patented in 1841 and kind of named these calotypes. Um, and so the, the positive images contain a value range that matches the original scene. Um, this was the first negative to positive photographic process, and that really became the basis of photographic printing um, from that moment onward. Talbot's calotype negatives could be used multiple times, so he could produce several positive images um, from a single negative, and he could do so quite cheaply. However, the positive calotypes were softer and more fuzzy than daguerreotypes. Talbot knew that this imprecision couldn't compete with the highly detailed daguerreotype in terms of commercial or documentary purposes, so instead he chose to explore photography's visual, aesthetic, and artistic qualities. This image, titled the open door from 1843 really sort of emphasized the shadows creating the pattern of diagonal lines um, that is then kind of echoed by the placement of this broom here and then these diagonals kind of contrast with the very rectilinear architecture. The soft lines and the slight haze kind of contributes to this sense of nostalgia that is being expressed and some have argued that Talbot is kind of honoring this very quiet rural way of life that was quickly being replaced by industry, commercialism, and urbanization at this time. One of the most important 19th century photographers was the Englishman Roger Fenton, who had a pretty profound influence on the medium, despite the fact that his career lasted for just over a decade. In 1855, Fenton traveled to the Crimean Peninsula on the Black Sea, where England, France, and Turkey were fighting a war against Russia. He spent March through June with the troops there, producing about 360 paper negatives in a horse-drawn dark room. Fenton wanted to avoid offending Victorian sensibilities, so he typically refrained from photographing the dead and the wounded. Um, he produced more than 300 images of encampments, battle sites, and portraits of all military ranks, and these images became really the first extensive photo documentation of any war. Um, he made salt prints using his paper negatives, which gave them a sort of grainy appearance and allowed the landscape to take on symbolic associations. Uh, one of his most famous photographs uh, from this series is also one of the most well-known images of war in general, um, and it's titled The Valley of the Shadow of Death. The Getty Museum explains, across a desolate and featureless landscape, not a single figure can be found. The landscape here is inhabited only by cannonballs, so plentiful that they first appear to be rocks, and they sort of stand in for the human casualties on the battlefield. 
The sense of emptiness and unease is heightened by the visual uncertainty that is created by the changing scale of the road and the sloping sides of the ravine. Uh, borrowing from the 23rd Psalm of the Bible, the Valley of Death was a nickname that British soldiers gave to this um, region, this area of land, because they were kind of under constant shelling there. Uh, the soft black and white image has a sort of eerie quality, and I think with it um, and the others of the series, Fenton really successfully captured the psychological and emotional intensity of war, and this sort of empty desolation of the aftermath of combat in a very sort of poetic and thought-provoking way. In about 1850 and 51, British sculptor and photographer Frederick Scott Archer sought to combine the high level of detail of the daguerreotype with the reproducibility of the calotype. He invented the collodion or wet plate process. Now this process is rather cumbersome and it requires a lot of equipment and chemistry that has to be wet in order to be light sensitive. However, it reduced exposure times to just a few seconds and it produced crisp negative images on glass that could then be used to make countless positive images on paper, again with very crisp details and a wide tonal variation. Despite the drawbacks, the wet collodion process's unparalleled quality and cheap cost made it an instant success, and it was really a major step in the development of early photography. Um, further advances in technology continued to make the process a bit less labor intensive, and by 1867, a dry glass plate had been invented, and so that really reduced the inconvenience of the wet collodion method. Photography quickly became popular for portraiture. Previously, the only way to get a portrait was to have an artist paint one, and that was quite expensive and time consuming. Photos were, after exposure times had been lowered, much more accessible and affordable, and far less time consuming for both artists and patrons. The prominent French artist, writer, and inventor known as Nadar opened his first photography studio in 1854, and although he only practiced for about six years, he was one of the most prominent photographers in Paris of this time. Um, he's really known for his collodion negative albumin print portraits of well-known artists, writers, politicians, etc. And he tended to focus on the psychological elements of photography, kind of aiming to reveal the personalities of his sitters rather than simply making attractive portraits. Um, he tended to use bust or half-length poses, solid backdrops, dramatic lighting, fine sculpturing, and a kind of give us this concentration on the face. Um, and he also tended to use eight by 10 inch glass plate negatives, which were significantly larger than the popular sizes of daguerreotypes um, used for portraits. Um, here we have two examples, two portraits of the actress Sarah Bernhardt from 1864 and 1865. Uh, Bernhardt at this time was about 20 or 21 years old and had just begun what would be her very long and extremely successful acting career. And Nadar's portraits really helped to increase her sort of celebrity status. Uh, Nadar very consciously chose to pose the actress uh, without the normal collection of elaborate props. Uh, instead, kind of placing her in the foreground, really emphasizing her delicate facial features and her slender neck, which is surrounded only by this lush fabric as she leans on this plain column. Um, photos at this time were typically highly posed because even though exposure times had been shortened, uh, they could still be up to a minute or a little more, um, so the sitter really had to be quite still. Um, though again, Nadar is trying to capture a sense of elegance and kind of capture the introspective aspects of the sitter's personality as well. Um, also, as a sort of side note, in 1858, Nadar was the first person to capture aerial photographs, uh, and he did so from the basket of a hot air balloon over the city of Paris. Another prominent 19th century photographer was the British Julia Margaret Cameron, who became very well known for her portraits of celebrities, especially of famous British historians, scientists, artists, and writers, many of whom had long been family friends. Um, Cameron tended to take a bit more radical, unconventional 
approach in her portraits. She pioneered the use of close-ups and highly controlled lighting in order to enhance her images of her subjects. But even more radically, she intentionally rejected the sharp focus of commercial portrait photography, which she felt sort of accentuated the physical attributes of the sitter, but neglected the inner character of the subject. Um, so, for example, in 1872, Cameron made a series of pictures of her great nieces, Laura and Rachel, um, and for these pictures, she dressed them as angels. She used her signature soft focus and a close perspective to help transform her nieces into cherubs, and the resulting photographs are somewhat like Renaissance paintings. Um, we have the child's clasped hands and crossed arms, um, especially in the image on the left with the title and the clasped hands in combination with those wings. Um, it really implies kind of a spiritual message. Um, and by adjusting the focus of her lens to create that soft, slightly blurred effect, Cameron is referencing the qualities of painting, particularly famous Renaissance and Baroque paintings of the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, and, you know, with these painterly compositions, subjects, and qualities, she's kind of elevating photography to the level of high art. Now, 19th century English writer and art critic John Ruskin argued that a photograph is not a work of art because of its reliance on mechanical devices. And in general, the public kind of struggled to accept photos as works of art rather than as simple records of reality. Photography was and sometimes still is perceived as being somehow easier or lower than painting or drawing in terms of artistic or aesthetic merits. But many photographers, such as Julia Margaret Cameron and others, sought to move the medium into the realm of art. The Swedish photographer Oscar Gustav Rylander felt that um, the way to make photography artistic was to emulate painting. In 1857, he created this, The Two Ways of Life, and he was using a very labor-intensive, time-consuming process that mimicked that of traditional artists. Um, this is a 16 by 31 inch print that he made using 30 separate negatives that he cut out like puzzle pieces. Um, he arranged them to create the larger composition and then exposed the negatives one at a time, covering the rest of the print from light each time. So the resulting appearance is sort of one of a seamless scene. Um, this took him six weeks to complete. And the subject matter is sort of an allusion to Raphael's Renaissance fresco, The School of Athens, which depicts um, Plato and Aristotle surrounded by the other great minds of antiquity, representing classical philosophy and knowledge. Um, Rylander's image features two youths being offered um, guidance and advice by this central patriarch. Um, each young man is kind of looking to one side of the stage like space, and one of them is being shown virtuous pleasures while the other is being shown sinful pleasures. So we have our kind of two ways or two paths of life. Um, Rylander had hoped that by mimicking the process and appearance of a painting, his photographs would sort of earn the same level of respect. And I would say that he was successful because Queen Victoria herself ordered a copy of this print. Um, now, at the time that it was made and, you know, first revealed to the general public, the partial nudity of some of these figures was deemed rather indecent by many people. However, after Queen Victoria gave it her stamp of approval, people kind of stopped complaining. So many early photographers tried to imitate traditional painting. However, the American photographer Alfred Stieglitz was one of the first to emphasize what he considered to be the particular strengths of the medium, which were its clarity and realism. Um, he produced artistic photographs, arguing that the medium had the same expressive potential and visual vocabulary as drawing or painting. He also promoted photography as fine art in his journal camera work and in New York galleries. Um, this is one of his most famous photographs. It's called The Steerage from 1907. Um, and so this was taken, Stieglitz was standing on the first class deck of a passenger ship, kind of looking down into the area that's called the steerage, which is basically the 
area of cheapest accommodations on the lowest deck. Um, it's meant to sort of separate the lower class from the upper class. Um, so looking down at this angle, Stieglitz was sort of struck by the composition of shapes and rhythms in the scene, including the smokestack that's sort of leaning to the left at one end, the iron stairway leaning to the right at the other, the chained drawbridge cutting across, the round straw hat uh, kind of up here to the top, and this group of women and children sort of down to the bottom. Um, and then he was also very interested in the sort of strong contrast of light and shadow, and I think just the interplay of the lines and the shapes as well. Um, he really found the composition to be thoroughly modern and sort of reminiscent of the abstract artworks that were becoming quite popular around this time. Um, Stieglitz felt that it was a point of honor not to crop or manipulate the negative image in any way. Um, he argued instead that the art was sort of in choosing what is in the frame and really emphasizing the natural, formal, and aesthetic qualities of the scene. So in 1878, new advances decreased exposure times to about 1 25th of a second, which finally allowed moving objects to be photographed and also lessened the need for a tripod. Uh, this new development is really celebrated here in English photographer Edward Moybridge's sequence of photographs called Galloping Horse or Horse in Motion. Um, this was kind of designed to settle the question of whether or not a horse ever takes all four feet completely off the ground during a gallop. Uh, Moybridge set up an experiment with 12 cameras lining a racetrack um, and as the horse ran down the track, they set off these trip wires that captured a sequence of 12 photographs. Um, in the photographs, we can kind of see that the horse indeed does have all four legs off the ground at once, but then we also can just demonstrate, or we can see the demonstration of this kind of new photographic method that allows almost instantaneous exposure. Um, shortly thereafter, in about 1888, a man named George Eastman developed a dry gelatin roll of film, which made film much easier to be carried. And he also produced the first small, inexpensive cameras, which allowed more people access to the technology. As processes and products became increasingly simplified and accessible, photography quickly became a hobby for millions of people, not just academically trained artists. Whereas earlier photographers sought to imitate styles and genres of traditional visual arts, amateurs and hobbyists were taking quicker, less staged pictures of casual subjects and of everyday life. Um, as more people began to own and operate cameras, fewer and fewer had any artistic training. And so we really start to see unplanned elements in the backgrounds of photos, in, as well as odd angles and vantage points, figures and forms at the edges of the frame and sometimes cropped off. And this really resulted in a totally new aesthetic of candid or snapshot photography. Um, for an example, in the late 19th century, Paul Martin photographed people in the streets of London. Um, he carried a small camera, which he typically would conceal in order to capture really candid shots of chance events like this one, which he's titled Cab Accident, High Holborn, London, 1893 to 96. Um, notice how the figures at the left and the bottom are cut off by the edges of the frame. And on the right side, notice how we have kind of this abrupt jump in scale between um, the man who is inside of the carriage that has kind of flipped over, this cab that has flipped over, and then the man kind of walking along the sidewalk behind him. Um, this chance of a moment that lines up these two figures as this, you know, pedestrian is just happening to walk by this event um, kind of gives us this unposed quality of the snapshot or maybe emphasizes it. And then that, along with the sort of sense of capturing a fleeting moment of a scene, um, because it extends beyond the edges of the picture plane. These things are totally new within the art world during this period of time, and they would actually become very highly influential on avant-garde artists in Paris, as well as other parts of Europe and the United States throughout the later 19th and early 20th centuries. 
So the gelatin silver process, which produces glossy black and white photographic prints in the dark room based on silver halide gelatin emulsions, was first introduced to the public in 1871. However, by the 20th century, it was really the preferred process for many photographers because it allowed them to capture the subject that they wanted in the ways that they wanted, with everything clearly in focus and highly detailed. Um, using this gelatin silver process, the French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson emphasized the lived moment in his photographs using a handheld 35 millimeter camera. Cartier-Bresson believed the most effective photographs captured the narrative effect of the moment, not just the height of action. He would wait until just the right moment, or what he called the decisive moment, um, when all the visual elements fell into place to snap the shutter of his camera. Um, we can kind of see this concept of the decisive moment here in his famous photograph, which is named after the location in which it was taken, um, the Guerre Saint-Lazare, which was a large train station in Paris. Um, if Cartier-Bresson had snapped this just one second earlier or later, the entire composition would have been different, and the figure would not appear to be suspended above the water the way that they are. Um, American photographer Ansel Adams also favored the gelatin silver process because of its clear focus and crisp details. Um, Adams was very much an environmentalist and he wanted to preserve America's wilderness. He used his photographs to share the beauty of the American landscape and to increase public awareness for the need for conservation. Um, Adams viewed aspects of nature as symbols of spiritual life, capable of transcending the conflicts of society in his majestic black and white photographs. Um, so here we have two examples. On the left in Sand Dunes, Sunrise, Death Valley National Monument, California, he's captured a full range of black, white, and gray tones to create this very balanced effect. And I think it's nice that he's kind of emphasizing um, the sort of natural presence of the elements and principles like line and shape within this composition. Um, sort of similarly here in the Tetons and the Snake River, he's captured the varying textures of the landscape with rich tonal variety, and he's carefully framed the composition so that we have the sort of natural slow rhythm of the river that kind of pulls us back into the space, and then we have the sharper, more urgent rhythm of the jagged peaks kind of in the background here. Before color photography was made practicable in the 1880s, people would hand tint photographs to make them more lifelike. Even once color processes were available though, many photographers avoided them because they were rather complicated and the results typically were not as chemically stable as black and white. Um, autochromes were one of the first commercially viable color processes made using an additive color process that used potato starch grains uh, colored with RGB dyes, recording tiny dots of color on a transparency. Um, autochromes like this one were quite fragile and very easily damaged by light, but many artists and photographers enjoyed the sort of painterly potential of their sharp contrast and their sort of dreamy atmospheric colors. In the 20th century, the most widespread color photographic process was chromogenic or C prints, which utilized dyes and developers to create a negative image that was then reversed into a positive print. American photographer William Eggleston is sort of credited with bringing this color photography into the realm of fine art. He kind of favored this dye transfer process because it allowed him a greater amount of control and the prints would last longer than other color processes. However, for each color, the corresponding filters must be aligned exactly, uh, kind of like when making a multicolor woodblock print. Another 20th century method of color prints is chibichrome, which used layers of CMY dyes that are bleached away based on the exposure to form a transparent, direct, positive image. Uh, this process produces vibrant, crisp colors on a super high gloss base, as seen here in Radioactive Cats by Sandy Skoglund. 
When digital cameras became available around 1985, it marked a huge shift in the medium of photography. And by around 2000, cameras started to be integrated into cell phones. Digital photography records images in the form of pixels, tiny squared dots aligned in a grid, uh, rather than on film. Images recorded as pixels can be stored digitally and printed on paper or projected on a screen or monitor. Canadian photographer Edward Bertinsky prints his digital photographs large scale on very high quality paper. Each tiny detail contributes to the whole and relates the vast expanse of urban landscapes and the relative smallness of humanity. Um, this photograph is from his China series, which focuses on factories driven by mass consumerism, where raw and recycled materials are turned into consumer goods and shipped worldwide. Um, this one is titled Manufacturing Number 17, Deida Chicken Processing Plant, and it depicts workers in an industrial chicken processing plant, and it sort of references the prominence of the human consumption of chicken worldwide. Uh, we have this stark contrast between the dark, grimy setting and the bright pink hooded smocks, the blue aprons, and the white boots that creates this very sort of surreal, almost alien scene that is both attention-grabbing and thought-provoking. Bertinsky says that he wanted his viewers to sort of come to their own conclusions about the photograph and about civilization's impact on the planet because, as he says, quote, it's not a simple right or wrong, it needs a whole new way of thinking. Many photographers present their images just as they were taken. However, another advantage of digital photography is that it allows artists to gather photographic materials on a computer and alter them using imaging software before printing them. Uh, the German photographer Loretta Lux tends to do this. She uses digital technology to assemble various photographic elements into a single composition. She takes pictures of her friend's children and then sort of subtly manipulates colors and proportions to make the subjects look otherworldly as if they've stepped out of a fairy tale. Um, for example, this image titled Waiting Girl features a young girl sitting on a vintage couch um, with this little cat kind of lounging next to her. Um, she is sitting very sort of um, upright and she has this almost blank expression as she stares out at the viewer. Um, her hair is in very sort of uh, clean buns or knots and she's wearing this uniform like dress and these things kind of along with the emptiness of the background sort of imply that this girl is in a very confined environment, probably surrounded by people who are much older than she is. Um, it looks a bit like a simple snapshot, but the artist has actually exerted very, um, a very large number of compositional choices here. She selected the model, the setting, the costume, and the color palette. Um, she posed the model and kind of coached them on their posture and expression. And then she employed imaging software to manipulate the image further. Um, notice how the girl's face is a bit enlarged, making her look somewhat out of proportion and really kind of emphasizing the largeness of her eyes. Um, also, the light that falls on the cat and the girl, it's sort of at slightly different angles, and it's very different than what falls on the couch. Um, and so, in reality, this is not really a single image, but rather a digital montage of several photographs that were taken at different times under different conditions, and then combined to reach a desired effect. Um, so without digital technologies, this image couldn't exist. So from its inception, photography has also served a documentary function by recording and preserving important people, places, events, etc. As the technology developed, it really proved to be a tool that could make visual statements in a more believable way than any other artistic medium. Amidst the political and social turmoil of the 19th century, photographers began to use the new medium to bring attention to current events, particularly the suffering caused by war, hunger, poverty, etc. Photojournalism is the use of photography to capture and tell a news story, and some of the earliest examples of photojournalism date back to the American Civil War, when collodion photographic equipment was portable enough to be used in the field. Um, 
Both Timothy O'Sullivan and Alexander Gardner were American photographers who began their careers as apprentices in the daguerreotype or in a daguerreotype studio, excuse me, in New York City before they then set out to capture their own images. Um, they wanted to document the historic events of the Civil War in 1861 to 65, um, but they really wanted to capture their own images of battle that would give citizens access to the carnage and the death of war in a way that they had never really had before. Now, yes, the equipment, the collodion wet plate equipment was more portable um, than it had been in the past, but it was still quite bulky and it required a dark room and lots of liquid chemicals, so it made their work rather difficult. Um, that didn't stop them though. Timothy O'Sullivan allegedly attempted to photograph during battles on multiple occasions and twice he claimed to have been struck with shrapnel, but because long exposure times could not capture action or motion, most early war photographs don't show combat but were rather taken in camps or um, on the aftermath of the battlefield. Um, both O'Sullivan and Gardner, though, wanted to really kind of move beyond traditional images of war that simply showed armies at rest, and instead they wanted to capture the grim and gruesome reality. Um, so these two examples here are great examples of, of what both O'Sullivan and Gardner were trying to do with um, early photojournalism kind of around this time. On the left, we have O'Sullivan's A Harvest of Death, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, um, which shows the bloated corpses of the Confederate dead awaiting burial after the battle. Um, this particular battle, the Battle of Gettysburg, caused the most casualties of the entire Civil War. And notice how O'Sullivan has kind of raised the horizon line, kind of making it quite high in the composition. Um, probably by squatting down with his camera to kind of get a lower point of view and that really extends this battlefield into the hazy distance and implies that the carnage that we see might also continue on forever. Um, the image captures though in crisp clarity the details of the face of the soldier, soldier in the foreground it was lying with his arms kind of flung out to the sides and this aspect really emphasizes the individual human level of these events. Um, on the right we have Alexander Gardner's home of the rebel sharpshooter again Battle of Gettysburg. Um, this image seems to capture the tragic death of a sharpshooter or a sniper that was killed in his lookout spot. However, this particular rock formation, um, it was rather short and set in the middle of the battlefield, so this really would not have been a good location for a sharpshooter to kind of set up. Instead, Gardner and his assistants have actually staged this image in order to intensify its emotional effect. Um, they would have drug the dead body over to this site and posed it so that the head faced the camera. Um, Gardner then placed his own rifle next to the body, emphasizing the sol soldier's horizontality and kind of reminding the viewer of the cause of his death. Um, the fact that this is staged kind of raises questions about um, visual fact and fiction. However, many 19th century viewers already understood very well that photographs were not without bias. Um, staging images like this was not uncommon at this time. However, it does still bring up ethical and moral questions. And so this has been an image of controversy. Um, today, we tend to readily accept that photographs can very easily distort exaggerate and even lie because they are manipulated, altered, cropped, and they only ever really give us a partial view. But credibility is crucial for news reportage and for documentation of events and history. And so the question of what constitutes truth in photography really affects its ethical use in photojournalism. And photojournalism is important in a lot of ways because it can lead to change. American photographer Louis Wicks Hine used photography to expose the injustices of child labor in the early 1900s. In 1908, he became the photographer for the National Child Labor Committee. Um, the work that he did was often dangerous. He went into factories, mills, mines, and other places, and he was often threatened by factory guards and foremen. 
um, because they didn't want him to come in and reveal their secrets, essentially. Um, but he would sometimes pretend to be a salesperson or a repairman, a safety investigator, um, whatever he needed to do to gain entry into these places. And then once inside, he would take photos as well as detailed notes about the ages of the children that he found working there. Um, when he published his findings, the public was shocked to see the often grueling and dangerous working conditions that these very young children were being placed in, and eventually his efforts led to the establishment of child labor laws in the United States. Contemporary photojournalism communicates events almost immediately on TV and the internet while simultaneously recording those images for history. Um, your textbook chapter discusses photographs of the World Trade Center on 9-11 and this particular image um, shows an exhibition that was put together by a group of photographers um, first in the days following the attack and then again um, a few times over the years following um, but this was an exhibition um, titled Here is New York, a Democracy of Photographs at the New York Historical Society, and this particular image is from 2007. Um, but this exhibition included photos from almost 800 people who had experienced the events of 9-11 firsthand. Um, so kind of giving a voice to all of these individuals um, who submitted their photos. Um, there are plenty of other examples of contemporary photojournalism that we could discuss. However, I think some of the most relevant or familiar things right now are probably the photos and videos that are um, coming out of Gaza that the people of Gaza have shared on the internet in the last several months. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind as you as you scroll social media or as you flip through the news or whatever you know you're looking at photojournalism and and those things are very important and very powerful and um it's important to kind of notice when we're being given um opportunities to see events like this in um, a new light or from a first-hand experience um, as a final note, your textbook chapter also discusses a few other examples of artistic photography, um, but we're going to stop here and then we will look at some other examples of photography, um, both art photography and photojournalism, later on during our themes section of content. Um, we will also look at a few examples of photo collage, photo montage, and digital manipulation within chapter 2.10, Alternative Media and Processes.